and welcome to episode 7 of Board Game Blitz, a podcast about all things board games that you can listen to in less time than it takes to watch the opening ceremonies of the 2016 Summer Olympics. This week's theme is hashtag winning. We'll be discussing games we've played recently like Dark Moon, Puerto Rico, and Quantum. We're giving our thoughts on this year's Spiel des Jahres winners, and we'll be sharing some of our favorite past Spiel des Jahres winners, as well as some of the nominees that didn't win the top prize. For our etymology segment, Crystal will be looking at the origins of the word win. And now, here are your hosts, Ambie, Cassidy, and me, Crystal. Okay, Ambie, I think you know that I am a big fan of Battlestar Galactica, the board game, Mm -hmm. and I have not somehow played Dark Moon yet, but you have, so I want to hear all about it. Okay, yes. For those who of you who don't know what Dark Moon is, it's a game formerly known as BSG Express. BSG is Battlestar Galactica. So it used to be a print and play game based on Battlestar Galactica, and it's like it's basically Battlestar Galactica the dice game. But uh, recently it was picked up by Stronghold Games and rethemed, and now it's called Dark Moon. So you're still on a spaceship, and there's like the infested, which are the Cylons, and then the uninfested are the good guys. So everyone has a secret identity. The bad guys, the infested, are trying to destroy the ship before the good guys can complete all their events. And the way it works is you have these event cards, and each turn you have a task that you have to complete. And to complete some of the tasks, you have to roll dice. So everyone can participate in the mission and they roll dice behind this player screen so you don't know what they rolled and the dice have a higher chance of rolling negative than positive but you want to roll so everyone like puts in any number of dice that they rolled you have to at least submit one so if you're a good guy you can roll all negatives and you have to submit a negative then everyone thinks you're bad (laughs) but even if you're good and then bad guys you can roll like you can pick to submit a negative or something so in order to complete the task, you need to hit a certain number total, totaling everyone's dice up, and then you uh, proceed through the events. It had a very f- similar feeling to a hidden trader game like Battlestar Galactica or Dead of Winter or something like that, but it plays in an hour. So Battlestar Galactica normally takes, I don't know. <laughs> Probably like two and, a, two and a half hours, maybe even okay. three, depending on the group, at least for my group. I was going to say four. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so B- BSG takes takes a while, but Dark Moon, every game we've played has been about an hour or less, so it, it's getting a similar feeling, but quicker. The difference is in the dice, you can't as control as much what you roll, or well, you can't control at all what you roll, but <laughs> you can't control, so sometimes like the good guys all roll negatives and they can't pass it, even if they want to, but that helps balance out so you don't know who the bad guys are. So I, I really enjoy it. It's weird. I'm actually it kind of, I've talked about this feeling for me before, but I'm almost afraid to try it because I love Battlestar Galactica, both the television show and the board game so mm-hmm. much that I don't want to love Dark Moon because I don't want to <laughs> replace that. Like I never get Battlestar Galactica to the table because it mm. takes so long to play. So having something with that same feeling is definitely something that I should own that yeah. takes less time i need to do it you should I, definitely one of my, try it yeah <laughs> yeah no i'm going to at some point for sure i want to try it just because i love bsg but i have a like uh, deep hatred of dice games yeah so also for your actions you have to roll dice so they were trying to repair the ship and like three good guys in a row failed at repairing the ship and I was a bad guy, so we won. But, <laughs> but yeah, I could see like that. That's very frustrating being a good guy and only rolling negatives, right? Like you can't do what you want to do. So that that's the main negative. But like it's a short game, and it, it gets a similar feeling. So I like it. Very cool, Cassidy. What have you been playing lately? I played Puerto Rico recently, and I was ah, reminded classic. of how much I thoroughly enjoy playing this game. It's it's a lot for new players but i absolutely love puerto rico so in puerto rico each player is attempting to produce goods and as you're producing the goods you're shipping them off to europe from puerto rico to earn victory points and during each round everybody is selecting one of the six to eight roles depending on the number of players so uh let's say i select the builder role So I will get to build one of the available buildings, but because I'm the person that selected the role, I get the bonus of having that building cost me one less doubloon. 
Well, then everyone else gets to build. So everything everybody selects, everybody on the table gets to do. It's just the person that selected it gets a nice little bonus for being that first person. So throughout the game, you're shipping off goods, you're trading in goods, all for the sake of those sweet, sweet victory points at the end. (laughs) But this was one of the most overwhelming games I played when I got back into uh, modern board gaming just because there's so many pieces and so many things to do. But I think I've uh, narrowed down my coffee slash corn strategy very well. That's awesome. (laughs) Puerto Rico is, I mean, old, obviously, being a relative term, but it's an older game comparatively to a lot of the other stuff that I think that we talk about on the show, right? Do you know what year it was released? I think it was early 2000s, 01 or 02, Mm. I think. I know that I played it at one point with my old game group in Kansas City, uh, like in 2007-ish. So I know it was before that. <laughs> but other than yeah. that, I really don't know. Well, I recently got a chance to play the game Quantum, which was released in 2013 from Passport Game Studios. It plays with two to four players. And in Quantum, each player commands a fleet of starships that are represented by dice. And the dice are translucent and neon colored and chunky (laughs) so while you have a hatred of dice cassidy this game i was instantly drawn to because i love dice and i especially love unique dice and these ones i literally was like i grabbed them and was like "Ooh, pretty like (laughs) i'm such a nerd there are really no words to describe how much i hate dice games (laughs) (laughs) well you might actually not hate this one because Those dice are each representative of one of your ships in your fleet, and those ships travel to different planets that are on tiles on the board, and then the goal is to move your ships to the planets and place your quantum cubes, and the first person to place all of their quantum cubes wins. You do roll the dice to start, but then each die's value determines both the ship's speed and its type and each type of ship has a different ability the lower numbers like the ones and the twos obviously move more slowly but they have much more powerful abilities the high valued ships move farther but they're generally weaker and they're easier to for other players to destroy and each ship also has a special ability tied into its numerical value and a lot of those abilities help you change either the position of your ship or its value. So it mitigates the randomness of the dice rolling in a lot of different ways. It did not ever feel like when you rolled the dice, if you rolled poorly, that you were just just stuck because you always have options to change things up. The board is modular. The tiles can be configured in a bunch of different ways. And the game actually comes with a number of suggested configurations, both for new players and for experienced players who want more of a challenge. Like there's tons of different suggestions. So there's a lot of replayability based on the layout of the board. And the game was truthfully pretty easy to pick up and learn, but it didn't feel like like I understood how to play, but it feels like there are a lot of interesting decisions to be made. So it definitely has a lot of strategy. Truthfully, it's not as thematic as a lot of other space games I've played. And while I generally like games with like thick, heavy theme, and this one is a little more abstract in that, I really enjoyed it quite a bit. I'm actually planning on adding this to my collection when I find it at a good price. So I give two thumbs up to Quantum Yeah, I played Quantum a few years ago. I normally don't like dice games either, but this one wasn't too bad. (laughs) So that's like a glowing (laughs) review for dice. (laughs) I mean, you're you're busy playing heavy Euros and 18xx games. So yes, from you, that is high praise. I like how you both talked about spacey dice games. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. I didn't even like think about that. So last month, the winners for the Spiel des Jahres were announced. For those who don't know, the Spiel des Jahres is an award for board game of the year. It's probably the most prestigious award given out for board games. And there are a few categories. There's the regular Spiel. There's the Kenner Spiel, which is slightly heavier games. And then there's the Kinder Spiel, which is for children's games. So there's these three different categories. The nominees for the Spiel were Codenames, Imhotep, and Karuba. And Codenames won. And for the Kenner Spiel, it was Isle of Sky, Pandemic Legacy, and Time Stories, and Isle of Sky won. 
For Kinderspiel, the nominees were Stone Age Junior, Mmm, and Leo Goes to the Barber. And Stone Age Junior, aka My First Stone Age, won. So we're going to talk about what we think about the winners and the nominees of the spiel and some previous spiel games that we also enjoy. I was actually... So the for the Kinner spiel and for the regular spiel, I was both surprised and not surprised because uh, Codenames winning the spiel kind of seemed like a given to me. That game has just blown up over the past year. It came out at yeah. Gen Con last summer and... It seems like everybody's been playing it kind of ever since. Definitely. It's one of my favorite games to bring out with any group. Like ev- everyone that I played it with has enjoyed it. Yeah, I mean, we have a weekly meetup and it's played at least two or three, two or three, maybe four times like every week. It's ridiculous. I, I got a chance. The first time I played Karuba was back in March at MeepleCon here in Vegas. And I, obviously, the nominees for this award had not been announced yet. I actually did not know that Karuba was a new game, like brand new when I played it. And I adore Karuba. It is pretty simple, but the, and it's like kind of the weird, like almost bingo mechanic where somebody calls out a tile and everybody else has to use the same tile was interesting, but like, there's so many cool strategic decisions there that I didn't expect in a game that's as simple as that. Yeah, I got the chance to play Karuba at Dice Tower Con, and I usually don't like tile laying games because normally it's the like the randomness of what you draw can get annoying. But here, everyone gets the same tile, so that that was nice. So it's more strategic than like a typical tile laying game, I think. I actually just got to play Karuba a few days ago, um, so I'm glad that I got to play it before this episode. <laughs> but I really enjoyed it. I've, I kind of have a fondness for tile placing games in the first place, but this one was really interesting for me just because everybody had their own board, which was really cool. And even though like the starter and the little the little ending piece were in the same place for everyone, it all everything just depends on where you place your tiles. And yeah. I just I really liked that aspect of it. I have not had a chance to play Imhotep. I did watch the Board Game Geek Game Night episode where they featured this game, so I actually got to watch an entire playthrough of the game, so I feel like I'm at least somewhat familiar with it, but have you guys had a chance to play Imhotep yet? Yeah, I was able to play it at Dice Tower Con too. So they had Imhotep and Karuba on like this hot games table there, so we were able to play a bunch of different games. But yeah, Imhotep, it was pretty fun. You're, you have these cubes that are goods and you're like putting them on ships but you can either put your cube on a ship or you can move a ship to a space so you can block other people like if they don't have their cube on a ship yet you can move the ship to a space so that they can't get to that space or if they put their cube on a ship you can move it to a space that they don't want to go to or something so that was pretty interesting i haven't had a chance to look at it (laughs) read about it anything (laughs) i'm a slacker based on the the playthrough that i watched i could actually see both karuba and imhotep kind well at codenames too truthfully but codenames is a little bit codenames is more of a party game and the Mm -hmm. other two are a little more traditional i think Mm -hmm. and i could see both of the other two kind of becoming really popular gateway games yeah obviously that's not a guarantee with any game some really great games tend to fall into obscurity after a certain amount of time, but both of those games seem to be pretty easy to pick up, but with interesting strategic decisions, similarly mm-hmm. to like Catan or Ticket to Ride, stuff like that. So, yeah. yeah, all the nominees this year were pretty solid games, I think. It was, I mean, Codenames is just so popular. <laughs> I don't, it's, it's hard to beat something like that. For the, for the Kenner Spiel, I the only I've played two out of the three, and of course the only one I haven't played is Isle of Sky. Isle of Sky did win the Kennerspiel, and it's really hard for me to judge whether that was the right choice or not because it's the one I haven't played. But Ambi, I think you've played Isle of Sky, right? Yeah. The, also at Dice Tower Con, I was able to play it once. It's another tile laying game, so I actually didn't like it that much compared to Karuba or or the other nominees for. Kennerspiel. The interesting mechanic was there's bidding, and that part I liked. So you have you draw two, three tiles and put them in front of you, and then you set a price for those tiles. And so other people can either buy them or 
not buy them. And if someone else buys it, they have to pay you the price that you set. And if no one buys it, you have to buy your own tiles. So I guess that's not really bidding. That's It's kind of more like the auction. It's like it's similar to what they do in uh, Castles of Mad King Ludwig. Yeah, kind of like that. But okay. everyone does it at the same time. So that was interesting, but it's still like tiling. After that, the, it's just like you lay tiles and get points for where you lay. I played Isle of Sky all of once, and it was a while ago, and it so underwhelmed me that I can't even remember anything about it. <laughs> I mean, again, based on your description, Ambie, it doesn't... Because the Kenner Spiel is supposed to be like a more... A heavier, generally a more strategic game, but... The, based on the description, it doesn't really sound like it would be that difficult to pick up. I mean, we're gamers, so obviously even difficult games aren't that difficult. Mm. But <laughs> I, I'm i really torn on this category this year because I adore Pandemic Legacy and Time Stories. But I also recognize mm-hmm. that both of those games are nothing like what typically gets nominated for this award. And they're really nothing like most board games in general. Legacy games are such a new concept. And Time Stories, while not a legacy game, is something completely foreign to anything else. Like, I can't liken Time Stories to any other game I've ever played. So I wonder if... And this is me speculating personal opinion. Nobody yell at me. I don't know. But (laughs) having not played Isle of Sky, I would almost guess that the reason what one of the reasons that it won is because it is more like a traditional board game whereas the other two are so outside of the scope of what is normal that it was hard to pick them as the winners what do you guys think but then it's weird that they nominated the other two if like that's the reason right so I, I don't well know. i mean what other games that came out it's honestly i tried to think of some other games that came out in the past year that would have been better nominees and i it's hard for me to pick something that's better. And I feel like they wanted to recognize these two games and maybe just didn't have another way to do it. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I, I always forget what came out which year, so <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, I think games have to be released. I, th- it's not a, I know it's not a calendar year. It's like yeah. up until a certain point, I think in the spring or early summer maybe, is the cutoff date for release. So technically, a bunch of the games that came out in 2015, I mean, both Pandemic Legacy and Time Stories started in 2015 at near the end of the year. And I'm, I don't know, I'm torn. I just, I love those games, but they're, it's so hard to compare against other board games. Yeah, they're completely different. And uh, Ambie and I have both played through all four of the currently available scenarios for Time Stories. And we are going to be doing a spoiler cast filled with our thoughts on all four of those scenarios. I have some interesting things to say, and I'm very curious, Ambie, to hear what your group's experience was like, because I actually haven't talked to anyone (laughs) about this game outside of the group I played it with. And obviously, we all had the same experience. So Yeah, so that'll be exciting. <laughs> so to our listeners, that will be coming out soon. I do not have an official release date for that yet, but it will be in the very near future. So keep your ears open for that, <laughs> I suppose. Only if you want to hear spoilers, though. <laughs> yes, very. it'll be... So if you have not played all of the four scenarios that are available, that would be Asylum, The Marcy Case, Prophecy of Dragons, and Under the Mask. If you have not played all four of them... You will hear spoilers in that episode. At the beginning of the episode, we will be very, very clear about that. But if you haven't played all of them and you don't want them spoiled, that will be one episode that you will probably want to skip. And truthfully, as much as I love our listeners and want them to listen to everything we do, if you haven't played the scenarios, don't listen to that episode because (laughs) I believe that Time Stories is an experience that is worth having for everyone. And I would hate if we somehow deterred someone from playing it because they listened to our conversation. We've talked about the nominees and the award winners here in 2016, but the Spiel des Jahres has been going on for quite some time. I want to say it started in the late 1970s. 79 was the, was the first. All right. And yeah, the first winner ever was Hare and Tortoise 
from Ravensburger games, although that's a confusing thing because there are multiple games now called Hare and Tortoise. I know Yellow has a game called Hare and Tortoise that is not the same one that won the Spiel des Jahres in 1979. Uh, what are some of your guys' favorite past winners? I was just looking at the Wikipedia page, and there's a special awards category, too. Some of them have puzzles, and in 1980, Rubik's Cube won. <laughs> What? I didn't even know that that existed. <laughs> but yeah, I, I used to do the Rubik's Cube a lot, so that just <laughs> jumped out at me. <laughs> I actually still have a Rubik's Cube at my desk at work. I'm a big fan of the 2012 Spiel des Jahres winner, which was Kingdom Builder. It was designed by Donald X. Faccarino, who is most well known for Dominion. Kingdom Builder is an enigma for me because... I, as I've discussed multiple times, love highly thematic games, and Kingdom Builder is exactly not that at all. <laughs> multiple people who have played it with me have been like, well, this is this is a great game, but Crystal, you like this? Really? And I I can't explain it. It's There's something in that game that I just find so wonderful. I will always play Kingdom Builder. I have... One of the first two expansions, and then I backed their Kickstarter for expansions three and four with a big box. And I, I'm i not a completionist. I typically do not get all the expansions for games, even ones that I like. Like Battlestar Galactica is a great example. I love that game, but I don't own all the expansions because I don't play it enough. But with Kingdom Builder, I want everything because I love that game <laughs> so much. Wow. Yeah, and with Donald X. Vaccarino games, Dominion won in 2009, and that um, I really enjoyed Dominion. I don't have it anymore because I played it so much, I got a little tired of it, but it was one of the first modern games that I played, and so I played it a bunch in college, and then later I used to play online on Isotropic, but that got shut down. So it is the, like, the most pure deck builder I've played, and it might have been like the first deck builder. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Ascension and everything yeah. else came out after. Yeah, so it it pretty much has no theme, but there's these ten kingdom cards in the middle that everyone can choose from. So you just build your deck and get points. You can play it pretty quickly, and it's pretty easy to learn because all the text is on the cards. So Niagara was the winner for 2005, and I actually have only played this game once, but I loved it so much because the board actually is a little waterfall. And you have these little, like, clear plastic discs that you're, like, pushing down the waterfall with your boats and stuff on it. And you're trying to capture all these gems before your boat goes over the waterfall. I just think it's a cute, fun, just everybody can sort of get into kind of game. I love it a lot. I hadn't heard of this game until somewhat recently. There was an episode of... I think it was Board Game Breakfast. It was one of the shows on the Dice Tower where I believe uh, Tiffany, the one tar, actually talked about this game and she showed it. And I immediately was like, I want to play this just because of that, <laughs> that cool, almost toy factor of the box with the waterfall and like pushing the boats off the side of it. Like I, I looked online and it doesn't look like it's easy to get a copy of this game super cheap no. at this point, but I, I should scour eBay and see if there's a used copy floating around because I've never tried it and I would really like to. It's so much fun. I just, I got lucky that they had it at our board game cafe in town. So if we, if we look back to some of the older winners of the Spiel des Jahres, are there any games in there that you guys kind of have any nostalgic feelings for? Like I know... The, the 1980 winner, which was the second year the award was given out. It was given to Rummy Cube, the little tile lane rummy game. I used to play that when I was very little with my grandparents whenever I would visit them. And my, my grandfather actually was a woodworker and he made a custom box to house all of the pieces of the game, wow. which my sister has now claimed because we, <laughs> we had to clear out my grandparents' house and she claimed the box of the Rummy Cube tiles. And I'm like, oh, I want it, but darn it, I don't oh. want to take it from my sister. So she obviously has a lot of good feelings about that game as well. I used to play that with my family a lot. Um, my mom really likes the game. She would always pick it for game night when it was her turn to pick. I've played it, but I'm pretty sure the first time I played it was a year ago. <laughs> so. Oh, wow. <laughs> and what's interesting, I haven't played it in such a long time. Yeah. I, I don't actually know how, how much I would enjoy the game itself now, but I'd be willing to give it a shot again for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess for other old games, 
the Sherlock Holmes consulting detective in 1985, but I actually didn't play that until like last year or two years ago. It got really popular a couple of years ago when Shut Up and Sit Down did a review on it. So we heard about it and it's not really like a board game. It's a mystery in text form. So you can go to different locations and then there's like a book with little paragraphs and they tell you what happens at that location and you can go anywhere you want and you're trying to figure out uh, like who murdered someone or whatever so there's 10 cases in the book so it's definitely not replayable because once you figure out the answer then you know but we had a lot of fun with that and there's actually a spin-off like someone made their own new cases based on Lovecraft Cthulhu theme called Mythos Tales and that was on Kickstarter, and we backed it, and that'll be coming soon. So, Oh, very cool. Really exciting. <laughs> Cassidy, do any of the older games? I'm pretty sure like the oldest one on there that I've played is Catan. And everybody talks about Catan. I don't want to talk about Catan. <laughs> I mean, but truthfully, as much as Catan is still talked about, that game came out now In 21 95. years ago. That's, that's yeah. I mean, that's... In, in board game years, not in people years, nobody get offended, <laughs> but in board game years, that's old. Yeah. Like, that really is. For a game to be one of the most talked about games 21 years after it was released, that's a big hey, deal. Hey, Catan can drink. <laughs> <laughs> oh, congratulations, Catan. Come visit me in Vegas. <laughs> um, Catan is actually one of the first modern games I really played. I think I played, like, Munchkin and some other little things before that, but Catan was really the first, and I know a lot of people can say that. Nope, that's a lie. Arkham Horror was the first modern game I played. <laughs> no, but Catan is is great. It's one of the few I can actually get my house to play, so that's nice. Go Catan. The robber's <laughs> still a jerk. In case it was not clear from the names of these awards, these awards are given out in Germany. So the awards are given out based on games that were released in Germany. So there are some games that have released in the United States that weren't released in Germany that didn't qualify. And likewise, there are games that were released in Germany that didn't come out in the United States. They don't have English versions. So if you look through some of the past winners, like you'll see stuff on there that is either impossible or difficult to get in the United States. But it seems like in modern days, generally, because the board gaming hobby has grown so much, if a game comes out in Germany and is popular enough to be nominated for the spiel, it's usually already been printed in English and it's become pretty popular in the States as well. Shout out to Germany for, you know, giving out cool awards. And having lots of crazy board game designers. Right? <laughs> yeah, man. Germans, Germans know what they're doing when it comes to board games. For this week's etymology segment, I'm looking at the origins of the word win. Win is a Germanic word that comes from the Old English word winnen, which means to labor, toil, struggle for, work at, strive, or fight. It can also be traced back to the word gewinnen, which means to gain or succeed by struggling, conquer, or obtain. Both of those words came from another word that meant to seek or to gain. Basically, winning's a big deal. And in the past, the words that it was associated with made the struggle a little more evident. I feel like at my next game night, I should, you know, make a bigger... It's, I've labored. I've toiled. I've struggled <laughs> for... Oh, wait. I don't win that often. So maybe, maybe this doesn't apply to me. <laughs> And don't forget, you only have one more week to enter our contest to win a copy of Codenames Pictures. Details about how to enter can be found in episode five, so go listen. Yeah, ha ha ha, we're making you do work if you want to enter our <laughs> contest. But it's really cool, and Codename Pictures is going to be awesome, so. Yep, I've played it. And that's it for this week's Board Game Blitz. Visit our website, www.boardgameblitz.com, to get links to all our social media pages, including our Facebook, Twitter, and Board Game Geek Guild. Have suggestions for the show? Shoot us an email at boardgameblitz at gmail.com. Until next time, remember, a quitter never blitzes and a blitzer never quits. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Don't forget you have, oops, you only, okay.
I mean, you can modify it. You don't. I don't care if you like change it. Obviously. 